God is good. And all the time. Come on, we got to do better than that. Uh, let's try it again. God is good. And all the time. All right. Now you sound like you believe it. <laughs> Turning to a slightly more somber topic. This past week, there were two more celebrity suicides. And it makes people wonder what's going on. The tragic deaths of celebrity chef Anthony Bourdain and fashion designer Kate Spade are causing people to ask why. Why? Why would they end their own lives when they seem to have everything? And why have the suicide rates climbed so dramatically in America? How many of you know that in like half of, the st of our states, the suicide rate has gone up in this year alone roughly 30%. In 2016 alone, there were 45,000 suicides. Suicides now lead deaths even above car crashes. It's sobering, and it makes you wonder what's going on. I think there are reasons, but our psychologists, our sociologists are struggling, trying to figure out what's going on. But I believe there is a reason why so many people are in despair and feeling so hopeless in our culture. As our culture has turned away from the God of the Bible and has instead embraced nihilism, nihilism is the rejection of meaning as defined by religious and traditional values. Nihilism is the belief that life is meaningless and existence is without purpose or direction. And that has, how many of you know, that has become the reigning philosophy of our time. That doesn't mean that there aren't still a lot of Christians. But of the general culture as a whole, unfortunately, they have embraced nihilism wholesale. You can see it in our education system, our entertainment, our music, our art. The message comes, life has no meaning. If that is true, if that is true, then why put up with all the struggle and the pain? And unfortunately, more and more are opting out of the struggle. This is especially tragic among our teenagers. How many of you know Jesus came to show us a better way? He is, listen, He is the meaning of the world. He is the answer to the huge questions of where did we come from and why are we here and where is this whole thing headed? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. And He said, you will know the truth and the truth will what? Set you free. Set you Free. Turns out that truth is not a set of mathematical axioms or a list of physical laws. Truth is a person. Truth is a person. It is God Himself in the person of His Son, Jesus Christ. All the rest. And thank God there are mathematical axioms which are quite beautiful and there are physical properties and laws that we can learn. But all of these are derivatives. In other words, all these are offshoots. All of these things flow from the God that is. To know Him is to know life. To reject Him is to reject life. To reject meaning. To reject truth to reject beauty and values and to embrace death as Christians we need to stand as prophets 
to our culture. And gently and kindly call people back to the God who loves them. Because that's the only place we're going to find being. We're continuing our series, Walking with Jesus. Our text this morning is Matthew 13, and Jesus begins to teach using parables. Using parables. Jesus has already given the Sermon on the Mount. He's given us the Beatitudes. He has demonstrated what God is like through his miracles, through his teaching. But now he, he changes slightly, and he begins to teach using parables. My message this morning is entitled, A Matter of the Heart. Well, let's turn this on, see if we can get it to go. Well, I have batteries in here. Someone's going to have to advance my slides for me. Matter of the heart. That's not it. <laughs> there it is. Not that far. Back up one. One more. There it is. Matter of the heart. Let's pray. Father, we stand before you in awe of you, God, in awe of what you've done, amazed by what you're doing, thrilled by what you're about to do. God, thank you for your word. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Next slide asks the question, why did Jesus teach using parables? Well, obviously Jesus wants to communicate things. In this case, he's about to teach on the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. And so it turns out that Jesus uses things that are seen to, to express, to communicate things that are unseen. He's about to teach us the kingdom of God, and he said, you can't see it. It's invisible. So he gives us a number of parables, of stories that express, that communicate what the kingdom of God is all about. So why did he use parables? Well, <clears throat> to use things that are seen to communicate that which is unseen. Secondly, stories can illustrate and create emotion. Isn't that true? If I sat right here and just told you one, you know, uh, didactic point after another, after about 20 minutes, even I would be bored out of my mind. <laughs> but what's beautiful is when, is when there's stories that we can connect with that. And that's what Jesus does. Remember last week we, and the week before, we looked at the greatest story maybe ever told, the story of the prodigal son. And it just creates emotion. You can connect with it. You can see what he's driving at. Stories are in, they're interesting, and they're easy to remember. I know most of you can't remember what I preached even last week, and that's okay. I'm the same way. But I have found this, that people remember my stories. And it's, that's the nature of stories. That's why Jesus used stories, because he knew it would lodge, it would connect, it would cause things to disconnect in our minds. So let's listen to this. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. The great cr crowds gathered around him so that he got into a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd stood on the beach, and he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, but, and immediately they sprang up, but since they had no depth of soil, when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns. The thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on 
good soil. Everybody say good soil. Good soil. And it produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Interesting phrase, that. In other words, he's, he's communicating something. It's a little deep. Can you hear it? Then the disciples came and they said, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and in hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophet Isaiah, prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, quote, you will indeed hear but never understand, for you will indeed see but never perceive, for this people's heart has grown dull. With their ears they can barely hear, with their eyes they have closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. And Jesus said, Blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. So here's the point. The parables of Jesus reveal the heart. Amen. They reveal the heart. You need to understand that... How do I put this? Jesus is not auditioning for a part. Okay, he is the Lord of glory. And he is here to bring a kingdom. And he invites those who will to come, to leave the kingdom that they are in and come to the kingdom that he is bringing. Before Jesus came, every single human being on earth was under one kingdom. It was the kingdom of darkness. Colossians 1.13 says that he, God, has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us to the kingdom of the Son that he loves. So when you're born into this world, you are born into the kingdom of darkness, friend, whether you know it or not. Now there's much about this world that's lovely, that's beautiful, and these are remnants of what God has created, but we ourselves are under dominion of darkness. But Jesus came that we might know life. He brought a new kingdom, and he is willing to rescue us, and did so. If we'll come, we'll follow him. We'll receive him. But not everyone will. But those who have ears to hear will hear, and those who have eyes to see will see, and he will deliver them. And I'm telling you that if your heart is closed, if your heart is closed, you will not understand the parables of Jesus. It's like it... It's like... The writer of Hebrews says the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides asunder between the spirit and the flesh and the bones and the marrow. And it reveals the intents of the heart. That's what these parables do. They reveal our hearts. So one of the purposes for the parables is, frankly, to separate those that have good hearts, those that have open hearts, those that have eyes to see, those that are spiritually attuned, those that are open, will hear. So let's look quickly at the meaning of the parable. Jesus went on in verse 18, Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. That is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word but 
cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke out the word and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands that he bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold and another sixty and another thirty. So the seed is the word of God. The word of God. This is what Luke says. Also the word of the kingdom is what Matthew says. I like that. This is the word of God. The word of the kingdom. And it is sown prodigiously. It is sown abundantly. In other words, man, there are just, there's seed flying every place. So it's not hard to find. It's just out there. It's flying. It's everywhere. How many of you know God is gracious? God is loving. And seed is just flying. The Word of God is just flying. It's out there. Not everybody hears. Not everybody sees. But it's flying. And, and it's landing here and here and here and here and here. The question is not is the Word going out. The question is what is your heart like? What is the soil of your life like? That's the question. Seed is everywhere. Number two, the word, like seed, has life in itself. It has life in itself. You take a little seed, just something little tiny, so amazing, you plant it in good soil, water it, and watch. It has life in itself, and it almost miraculously, it just emerges. It begins to do its thing. It's incredible. So it is with the Word of God. The other thing we know about seed is that it is very expensive and it is very precious. Friend, listen. You are blessed if you hear the Word of God. You are blessed if you read and understand the Word of God. He who has ears, let him hear. What is he saying when he says that? He's saying, don't just hear with these. Hear with this. Of course, the sower is God and his servants. The word originates with God. Of course, who else could do that? God has originated the word. God has generated. Jesus himself is the word. God uses people to spread his word. Thank God for that. But here's the point, and here's what we're getting to. The soils represent people who hear the word. This is us. Yes, it's nothing wrong with, how many of you know there's nothing wrong with the seed? The seed's perfectly fine. Nothing wrong with the sower, God knows what he's doing let's look at the soil soil represents people who hear the word the first one the hard packed soil represents those who do not understand and the evil one snatches away what is sown and Luke says snatches away from their hearts what is sown it just simply does not penetrate. If you've ever lived out in the country, you've, you've seen where people are, are like walking through a rural area, they'll walk through a field. We see this in India where we go a lot. There are, you know, there are just uh, vill villages, and right outside the village there are all these cultivated fields, and there maybe is another village maybe a half mile away or a quarter mile away, something like that. And people from this village are traveling to that village and, by, and they're walking across the fields and they use the same path every time. And guess what happens to that dirt on that path? It just gets hard like this tabletop here. This is what he's talking about. It's just so hard, packed. And when the seed comes when the word of God comes when the seed comes it lands but it does not penetrate 
Friend, listen to me. If your heart is hard, if your heart is hard, the Word of God and the Word of God does not penetrate, the enemy will steal it from you. And it'll just be gone. This is why when we share Christ with people, some people receive it, some people don't. There's lots of reasons for that, but one of them might be that their hearts are so hard that they just don't understand. They don't receive. The enemy just comes and snatches it away, and it's gone. Rocky ground represents those... Not going to do it, are you? There it is. Rocky ground represents those who at first receive with joy, but quickly fall away when trouble or persecution arise because they have no root. Many, purple, many people receive Jesus. They receive the word of God. They believe until the very first trial, until the very first hard patch, the very first difficult stretch, and they quit. They give up. I didn't sign up for this. They have no root. Number three, the thorny ground... Oh, back up one. The thorny ground represents those who hear but allow the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches to choke out the life before it can bear fruit. They hear, but other things crowd in. Chokes it out. I mean, we've over the years, we've heard about celebrities, for example, that have received Christ. How many of you remember Bob Dylan back in the 70s? There was uh, like a three-year period where Bob Dylan was, was an evangelical Christian. And he even cranked out some records, pretty good ones, actually. But then, I don't know. I don't know what happened. My guess is, a little trouble, cares of the world, something, deceitfulness of riches. I don't know, but something kind of choked out the life before it had a chance to bear too much fruit. And now he's walked away from it and he's gone back to his Jewish roots. And he's embraced Judaism and some weird forms of that. It happens. It happens. I've, how many of you know John Lennon made a decision for Christ at one point in his life? The Beatle, John Lennon, sitting in his hotel room watching, believe it or not, a TV evangelist. I know. Supposedly, and he writes about this, he, he made a decision for Jesus. And he said he felt this warmth and he prayed the prayer and he received Jesus. He, he invited Christ in his life until Yoko Ono heard about it. And she said, no way, we're not doing that. We're not going there. And he went, okay. And that was the end of that. It happens. How about you? The good soil represents those who hear and understand, as Matthew here says. But Luke's gospel also adds, and hold it fast in a good and honest heart. I like that. We also know that the good soil will bear much fruit. Jesus says some 30, some 60, some 100 times as much. 30 times as much as what you sowed. American farmer would be thrilled to get a tenfold return on his wheat seed. An American farmer, a world farmer, would be thrilled to get 16 times back on his corn that he plants. Nobody gets 30, 60, or 100-fold. Nobody except God. God's a really good farmer. But what he is saying here is that it's miraculous. All of this is miraculous. The return you get by receiving the Word of God and holding it 
in a good and honest heart will produce miraculous returns. That's what he's saying. Just means that everyone brings forth a lot of fruit if you hold on to it with a good and honest heart. So we're going to close like this. So is it, why are some fruitful and some are not? Is it the seed? Something wrong with the seed? No. Is there something wrong with the sower? No. Could there be something wrong with the soil? Maybe. And I just want to tell you this. This is not as fatalistic as some of us have been led to believe. Some of us have been led, I've heard messages where, you know, you can't change what kind of soil, soil you are, you just are what you are. And Jesus is uh, simply telling you what's, what it is. This is just the way it is. Some of you are this, some of you are that, some of you are that, that's all. Whatever it is, too bad, stinks to be you, but that's the way it is. How many of you know you always have a choice? You always have a choice. So let's look. Let's look at what I think God is saying here. It's a matter of the heart. We always have a choice. Number one, do not let your heart get hard. Do not let your heart get hard. Ephesians 3, 7, I'm sorry, Hebrews 3, 7 says this. So as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. He's writing this to Christians. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another today, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Can I tell you this? I've seen Christians whose hearts are hard because they've gone through a time of testing. They've gone through a lot of trouble. How many of you know life is hard? Life is hard. You live long enough, you're going to get creamed. You know, you just are. You're going to get flattened, creamed, and then maybe creamed a second time. That's life. That's the way it goes. And if you allow that to turn you bitter and angry and harden your heart, you will resist the Word of God. The Word of God will not be fruitful in your life if you allow your heart to become hardened. Okay? So what do we do, Pastor? Well, just keep coming back. Just keep coming back to God. Yell at Him if you have to. What is up with this? I hate this. How many of you know God doesn't get freaked out <laughs> by our honest emotion? He already knows we cannot surprise him. But when we're honest with him, guess what? He will be honest with us. If you draw near to him, he'll draw near to you. He will allow you and me to go through periods, times of testing in which you wonder if you're going to make it. Just do not allow that to harden your heart. Just keep coming back. Keep coming back. And I promise you, you'll get through it. You'll get through it. And he also says, none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Jesus talked about the deceitfulness of riches. I... I don't really know because I'm not a rich person. But my guess is one of the reasons that so many wealthy people live in such despair is because they thought being wealthy was the answer. And they have finally, finally discovered that it isn't. It just isn't. I mean, if they'd read the word, they would have known that. But... A lot of people don't read the word and they imagine that, oh boy, when I'm rich, I'll be happy. When I am wealthy, I'll finally, I'll be there. I'll feel fulfilled. 
and they most of us never will but so we can continue to amaze and astound ourselves with stories of how great it'll be when we get there unfortunate for the people who do get there and discover it's as empty as as you can imagine and there's just despair there's just despair listen our joy does not flow out of our wealth, out of our riches, out of the abundance of what we have. Our joy flows out of God himself. Our joy flows from Jesus, from Jesus Christ. Don't let your heart get, get hard. Secondly, let God deal with our stony hearts. Let God deal with our stony hearts. How many of you know it's just easy sometimes for our hearts to get really hard, stony? When that happens, all kinds of weeds and junk grow in our lives and it can choke out the Word and we don't bear much fruit. But I love what God says in Ezekiel 36, 26, I will give you a new heart and I'll put a new spirit in you and I'll remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Hallelujah. How many of you know this is something God has to do? I can't do this. I can't fix. How many of you know I can't fix myself? Neither can you. I mean, you can't fix you. Can't fix me either, though some of you have tried. I wish you could, but the truth is only God can fix us. You understand? And he says he will. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? Deliver us from the cares of this world. The cares of this. How many know there's a lot of cares in this world? It just is. We all got them. I could share, you, share with you all of mine, but I won't. Mark, Mark's gospel, the way he writes this, Jesus says, Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Come on, worship team. God has to compete with a lot of stuff, right? For our attention, for our affections, for our hearts. And there are things that happen to us, the worries of life. <laughs> Ryan, you shared with us the other night, the other day about uh, just worrying about are we going to pass the tests for the to, to sell the house. Believing God and yet just the worries of life, it can just choke out. Thank God you held on, you were faithful, and, and, and so is God. So is God. It's all God. Friend, I don't know what you're going through. My guess is you're probably going through stuff because <laughs> that's life. I just want to tell you, it's all God. It's all about God. It really is. Do not allow it to distract you, to pull you away. I want to close this way. Come on. One more time. You can do it. No. Okay. May we have open and honest hearts before God. That's number four. May we have open and honest hearts before God. I like the Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthians says this. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and open wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us 
as a fair exchange I speak as to my children open wide your hearts also I feel like this is almost a prophetic word for us from God God has opened his heart wide to us but for some reason it's the human condition we tend to withhold withdraw our hearts from God I'm not sure why maybe it's maybe it's all these reasons or maybe it's fear or maybe it's unbelief or I don't know but I think what God is saying to each of us today is will you open your heart to God today in a new way in a fresh way will you let go of the pain and the hurt of the past things that maybe have caused your heart to get a little hard a little stony will you let that go will you let him remove all of that and will you just open your heart to him allow him to speak to you to plant his word in the soil of your heart will you hold that open with an honest heart before God watch what happens watch what happens you will bear fruit friend how many of you want to bear fruit for God I do and I promise if you do this you will be astonished 30 60 100 fold. it's miraculous fruit will come from your life if you will do this let's stand worship God in Jesus name